Beers with Chad. Hey everybody, what is up? Chad Wesley Smith here, another episode of Beers with Chad. Um, today, been a good day, trained some jiu-jitsu this morning, heading off to New York tomorrow night for the Juggernaut Performance Summit this weekend, this Sunday on Long Island. Uh, jiu-jitsu tournament next weekend in Las Vegas, so things are good. Cheers. This week's Jug Life and Beers with Chad are brought to you by uh, ZipRecruiter. So if you're looking to hire someone for your job, ZipRecruiter posts to over 100 of the web's best job boards all at once, guaranteed to find you a qualified candidate in less than a day. So if you're an entrepreneur like myself, maybe you're the boss, you need to hire someone, check out ZipRecruiter.com slash Jug Life. Tonight, I am drinking Cetus, Cetus, one of those, by uh, the Connecticut Valley Brewing Company. Uh, it's a New England style IPA. Those are all all the rage today. Utilizes an abundance of galaxy hops with a touch of Mandarina Bavaria to impart a fruity tropical aroma, slightly su- sweet hints of mango, and a clean undertone of melon round out this intensely hot brew, which finishes with a pleasant lingering note of tangerine. You can get this beer, many other craft beers from around the world from the Tavor app. Uh, I downloaded that last month, been been using it. Really cool, simple, sends you push notifications, beers you haven't heard of, beers uh, you know that maybe you're looking to try but you can't find them at your local store. Boom, Tavor sends them to you. You can find out more about them and sign up through the uh, link in the video info. So cheers. Thank you to Connecticut Valley Brewing Company. Do not miss out on my bench manual on presale at this exact moment. If you're watching this later on YouTube or listening uh, on any of the places that you can find the Jug Life podcast, it might still be on early bird pricing, but regardless, it's out. It's available if you need to learn about uh, your equipment, warm-ups, technique, exercise selection to address different weak points, um, as well as programming considerations and a beginner, intermediate, or advanced program. It's all right there for you. If you have the squat manual squat manual, and you like that, you're going to like the bench manual too, so go ahead and check that out. This week on the Juggernaut YouTube, packed with content as always, we had a Strength History Minute with Yurik Vardanian. Um, we got a new series beginning on addressing weak points. The first one will be in the squat. And if you have the problem of rounding over, we'll show you some exercises to fix that. Continue our jerk pillar series with jerk pillar number two. And this week's um, Jug Life episode was with Scott Saulwasser. And Scott is the director of speed and power development for Texas Tech football, the Red Raiders. Uh, and I got to know Scott when he was a assistant strength coach at the University of California, Berkeley. He reached out, uh, and myself, along with Dr. Quinn Hennock, uh, got to go up there and do a seminar with their staff. Uh, since then, we've, we've had part of our weightlifting team camps there with the, uh, with the Golden Bears staff. I went to school there for a couple of years, so that was fun. Really cool to see Scott now in his position at Texas Tech, doing great things. They had a really cool deal at Texas Tech a couple of weeks ago where, uh, where Kaylor Willem came and, and pulled some big deadlifts and acted like he was uh, transferring in linebacker and was kind of blowing everyone's, everyone's mind there. So, uh, you know, in, in the episode with Scott, we get to talk a lot about, you know, sort of his foundational ideas about training athletes, um, the way that the weight room influences speed and power development, his specialty, and how speed and power development impact strength development and how those those two kind of have to go hand in hand um and i got some questions on on youtube comments of people asking you know that they're just not really that familiar with the idea of of training athletes that they that they're in the world of powerlifting weightlifting bodybuilding you know where most of our content is focused but but some of those ideas were a bit foreign to them 
So I wanted to talk more about those because that's really what my background is. That's where Juggernaut was was founded. That's why I've gotten to connect with people uh, like Scott Saulwasser, who's actually doing, he said, the exact program. This is for him, his own training right now, but the exact program from my Juggernaut football manual, uh, trying to run like a 4940 at 38 years old. So I'm, I'm excited to see Scott do do that coming up. Uh, and apologies, Scott, if I if I showed you on the time, it might even be faster than that. Um, and we also have a lot of cool upcoming sport performance content. Uh, in addition to talking with Scott, uh, we also had a great episode that we filmed with Frank Wintrick, the head, uh, the director of football performance at UCLA. Next week, I'm very excited to interview Dr. Michael Yesis, who's you know really one of the iconic names in all of of strength and conditioning research and, and writing and, and just a, a true legend. Uh, we also have Mark Fitzgerald, the uh, performance coach for the Anaheim Ducks. Uh, he took over after the Tony Perkis scandal that uh, you may have seen in Heavy Ducks. So I want to just get you more familiar with a brief overview here of some of the pillars of sport performance training. So I'm going to lead off with... Uh, the most important thing that you can do is understand the parameters of your sport. You know, you, you can't train football players, and, and that's what I've done a lot, training football players, jiu-jitsu, uh, as well as aquatic athletes, volleyball, all kinds of stuff. But you can't train whatever other sport, like powerlifting, or like weightlifting, or like strongman, or like bodybuilders. Even if you are, you know, as a coach, a powerlifter, weightlifter, strongman, bodybuilder, whatever it is, the athletes you're training aren't, and it's not appropriate to train them that same way. Uh, to the, that effect, if you want to go and, and look up an old article from me called like, Why Strongman Training Isn't for Athletes, uh, I wrote that probably five or six years ago, uh, but I still see it get, get brought up from time to time, and it deals with this exact problem, uh, as, and I was spurred on to write it because I saw a video of a really prominent Olympic swimmer being trained with a lot of strongman movements because that's what his coach was into because uh, his coach competed in strongman. But swimming and strongman don't have shit to do with each other. Uh, and powerlifting doesn't have very much to do with, with football and so on and so forth. So you need to understand the parameters of the sport that you're dealing with. You know, how do the athletes move in the sport? How fast, how far, for how long a time periods, for how long of rest do they get between those intensive bouts of, of activity? What are they doing? In those rest periods, are they, you know, still walking or jogging? Are they standing in a huddle? Um, you know, how many times are those intensive bouts repeated? Um, how, what type of resistance do they incur along the way? Uh, you know, now in the current strength and conditioning uh, community, there's a, an abundance of technology and GPS technology that can give that data very, very simply and incredibly accurately to that to, to strength and conditioning staff. So it's really cool to see that. Before, I was looking at things called time motion analysis that would give that type of data. But that's the first thing you need, you need to do. You need to understand what your athletes need to be prepared for so you can accurately prepare them for that. From there... I think it's important to understand the concept of special strength and transfer of training. Transfer of training is a concept, uh, you know, a, a term made popular by Dr. Anatoly Bondarchuk, who served as the uh, national throws coach for the Soviet Union for many years, uh, developing the two best hammer throwers of all time, uh, Yuri Sadiq and Sergei Litvinov, uh, and just had a lot of you know incredible research and sort of a paradigm shift in thinking about going from, from general qualities to uh, special strength qualities. And I'll, I'll get a bit more into that. But something that really made this idea of, of special strength exercises and that it's not just about how much can you squat, bench, deadlift, and not even necessarily how high or far can you jump or fast that you can run, but really how well can you perform these, these uh, specific sporting movements and I was training one of the first NFL players I ever got to work with is a guy named Alex Parsons. And I'd known Alex uh, since we were in high school. We played high school football against each other. And I always hated him in high school because he, he went to our rival. And I thought he was a real cocky prick. But now we're friends. And so I was training Alex. And it was the year of the NFL uh, strike several, several years ago. And Alex 
uh, was playing for the Raiders. He was an, uh, an offensive lineman, came from USC, and was not a very strong guy in the weight room. You know, when I started working with him, maybe benched 350, 360 pounds, squatted not much more than that, and it was a guy 6'5", 315, big guy, athletic, and moved very well, but didn't didn't have, you know, good weight room numbers, and not, you know, particularly explosive in terms of, like, a really far broad jump or high vertical jump, uh, and, and I had all those things. I was, you know, this was like 2011, I was benching five, five, 515 pounds, squatting 900 pounds, I had over a 30-inch vertical, you know, still even at that time, though I wasn't throwing the shot put anymore, well well over a 9-foot broad jump, all the, all these things. And then we, I, I was watching Alex do these med ball chest pass drills. He would start, on, it, he was going, from, I had him go from his knees, and he would explode with his hips out and throw the med ball against the wall. And I, and it first just st- struck me, the, the sound of it, I was like, Jesus, this ball is about to break on the wall. He was so powerful and forceful in that movement. And even though I could, you know, bench more, squat more, do any Olympic lift more, jump higher, jump farther, run faster than him, he could do this, something very, very high transfer to his sport, much better than I could. So that those general qualities didn't transfer over. And... You know, why is that? Well, Alex had done something like that movement, delivering a two-hand punch thousands, if not tens of thousands of times over the last several years, playing offense line for USC and, and into his time in the NFL. And that's what really made it click for me and and made me want to dive deeper into the, the work of, of Dr. Bonnerchuk and, and better understand this exercise classification system Um, of special exercises, special developmental and special preparatory exercises versus general developmental and general preparatory exercises. And the best way that I can quickly summarize that for you is that a special developmental exercise is going to be an exercise that mimics the direction, duration, or velocity of a sporting movement and overloads it in some way. All right, so the, the term sport-specific exercise, that gets thrown, thrown around all the time. But a lot of times they're, you know, they're not mimicking direction, duration, or velocity. Or that last important caveat, they're not overloading it in some way. Because if, if you're just you know, running around with a, with a weighted football, like, eh, is, what, what is that actually benefiting? And you have to be very careful with those type of exercises that they don't interfere with sport form. And then general developmental and general preparatory exercises are going to be kind of everything else. Like most weight room exercises for field sport athletes are going to fall into general developmental or general preparatory exercises. Uh, And that's looking at developing general organism strength, uh, you know, muscular size, helping that the athlete, you know, gain body weight, gain good body weight, uh, injury prevention exercises are all going to fall into that category. So understanding what special strength is, what exercises are going to transfer the most to on-field performance, the concept of transfer of training, really, really important if you want to train athletes and do it well. Uh, the next thing is going to be categorizing weight room movements. You know, people who, who listen to Juggernaut and watch Juggernaut content you're probably your your weight room guys, your weight room guys and 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 girls. You you do powerlifting, you do weightlifting, you're you're into that stuff. So that's probably what you want to hear about is is the weight room stuff of, of what to do with athletes. And when I look at weight room exercises for athletes, I think about movement categories rather than specific exercises. You know the the debates of what is better for for a football player. You know, is a front squat more functional than a back squat or a box squat or a safety squat bar squat? Is kind of a useless argument. Um, what we need to be looking at is what can the athlete perform well. And there's four main categories that that's that they need to be performing. So that's going to be, you know, squat movement category, a hip hinge hip extension exercise upper body pushing and upper body pulling. What exercises they actually do are going to depend on a lot of things. And there's three kind of main ideas that that I encourage people to think about as they're deciding what exercises to use with their athletes. First up, can the can the athlete do the exercise properly? You know, do they have good technique so they're going to be safe? Um, 
you know, does does a uh, football player's bench press technique need to look like an IPF powerlifter's? No, it, it kind of just needs to be good enough, but you don't want to put your athlete at risk in the weight room with, uh, with bad technique. From there, can they create some significant output with the exercise? So can they actually move some weight? Because if you're in the weight room to get strong, you have to choose it. Uh, movements that the athlete can can move some weight on. So while you may love front squats, if the athletes you're working with can't front squat for shit because they can't hold the bar well or they don't have the necessary ankle mobility for it or whatever, and they can't put very much weight on the front squat, but they can safety squat bar you know to a box squat really well, then that would be a better exercise choice. And you can work alongside, uh, you know, that time to improve ankle mobility and stuff. But don't get caught into thinking that this exercise is the best exercise for football players or for basketball players or hockey players, whatever it is. Because the only thing that is irreplaceable to the athlete is sport practice. All the other stuff, the squat movement category, the, the, the hip hinge, hip extension movement category, upper body press, upper body pull... Those can all be changed, and, and they should be changed based on, on what the athlete is, is ready for. Some, some athletes, you know, a goblet squat might be their squat choice, or a front foot elevated, you know, five-second eccentric split squat, or a rear foot elevated split squat. And some athletes might be, you know, high bar ass to grass Olympic squatting, because that's what they're prepared for. Um, the same thing in the squat hip hinge. Some of it might be, you know, an, an RDL uh you know, staggered stance, RDL variations. Some of them might be clean grip power snatch. Uh, there's, a, there's a big range depending on what the athlete can tolerate. And then finally, how does it fit into the bigger context of their training plan? Uh, you know, what, what phase of, of the year are, are the athletes in right now? Let's say if you work with football players right now, they're probably in training camp, hell week, you know, getting ready to start the season. They're in a very high volume practice period. So while, you know, high bar ass to grass Olympic squatting might be a great exercise to improve uh, leg strength, it might not be a great exercise during this phase of the year because they have to run so much right now. They're going to be sore from that. Maybe you're going to increase injury risk by, by making that exercise selection. So something like a safety squat bar box squat could be a better choice right now or a belt squat or, um, you know, a split squatting variations or even leg pressing to keep some general organism strength in there but not overload them because how much they squat should not be your ultimate goal. Rather, it should be how well do they play their sport. Uh, the next thing to, to really think about is being about organizing the week, the training block, and then the annual plan for the athlete. Um, the way that I prefer to do that is through what we call a high-low sequencing system. All right, And that, that is an idea that was... Mi- made very, very understandable to me by James Smith. You may know him as The Thinker. Um, His website is uh, Global Athlete Concepts. You could have seen him on the PowerCast a few years ago. Uh, Super, super smart guy who I had the good fortune to employ uh, for, for about a year, and it was like beyond a master's class in understanding training and this concept of high low a high low sequencing system sounds really fancy but what it boils down to is organizing your most high stress activities into the same days or into a few days over the week and following them up with medium or lower stress days so that you can actually facilitate some recovery during the week so in the same way that a powerlifter wouldn't likely wouldn't want to have you know their their squat and deadlift days on back to back days because they wouldn't they wouldn't be properly recovered you know a football player isn't going to want to put their two hardest days of practice back to back and or in the off season you know they're not going to want to put their biggest day of of sprinting jumping you know squats and and power cleans back to back with their biggest day of of med ball throws bench pressing you know and more uh, special 
developmental exercises or more sprinting and jumping, that kind of stuff. You want to sequence it out throughout the week to facilitate better recovery. Uh, this also goes to the concept of consolidation of stressors, particularly as you get into creating an annual plan. I have many, like a three-part article uh, titled Consolidation of Stressors that you can read and go more in depth with this. But that's pretty much, you know, to sum it up in a nutshell would be early in the off season when the athlete is not as capable of high level outputs because they're a bit un under trained or detrained coming out of their season. You can have more low medium days all in a row, like five or six of those per week. And then as they get closer and closer to the season and more capable of higher level outputs, sprinting faster, lifting heavier weights, then you're going to need to consolidate those intensive stressors onto fewer days. So rather than, you know, five medium days throughout the the week. Now you're going to have maybe Mondays and Fridays as, as really high intense training days. Wednesday is more of a medium day and Tuesday and Thursday as low days. So, you know, read more about that stuff from James Smith, Global Athlete Concepts. And I just wanted to, to kind of, you know, get those ideas uh, going through your heads as you, you know, watch our, our Jug Life with Scott Salwasser, as you look for upcoming content with Frank Wintrick from UCLA, with Dr. Michael Yeses, with Mark Fitzgerald, with all these great people. If you like this type of content, let me know in the comments and we'll try and create more sport performance training uh, content. Plus, if, if you're so inclined to do so, go back into the archives of Juggernaut articles and you'll find a ton of this stuff, particularly from like 2011, 12, 13. You'll find a ton of this stuff, so go check that out, read up all about it. Um, if you're looking for another good podcast to check out, what I'm listening to right now is the Origins Podcast by James Andrew Miller. Uh, I went back into to some older seasons where he's talking about uh, ESPN and sort of the history of of the, the channel and their business and developing stuff like 30 for 30 and pardon the interruption. He's got a whole season about Curb Your Enthusiasm, one of my favorite shows. And right now the current season is with Nick Saban. So if you're interested in learning how to win, developing great team culture, being process oriented, check out the Origins podcast by James Andrew Miller. Uh, the episodes about Nick Saban are fantastic. Uh, my bench manual, again, it's out. Equipment, technique, uh, exercise selection, program design, plus a couple different programs. Um, you can get it for $17 until Friday at 9 a.m. Uh, that's Friday, August 17th at 9 a.m. Then for a couple more days, it'll be $22, then up to $27, the normal price. So get that at store.jtsstrength.com. Interested in online coaching for powerlifting, weightlifting, super total, strongman, or power building? Juggernautcoaching.com is the place for all of that, uh, you get to work with myself, Marissa Inda, Max Ada, more great coaches like that. And uh, we get you covered whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced athlete. Jug Life Podcast, you can find it on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and thejuglife.com. This is Beers with Chad, a bonus episode to The Jug Life, but find it on the same feed. Share it with a friend who needs to hear about this stuff. Subscribe to the Juggernaut YouTube, four, five, sometimes six new videos a week. We take a lot of pride in, in what we do there and are very proud of it thanks to Shorty Sedang, the world's strongest videographer. I'm Chad Wesley Smith. This was Beers with Chad. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Cheers, and we'll see you next week.